Okay, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Morning, morning. Uh, let's see. I put a couple of announcements on the board. The office hours, again, are from 9 to 10 today and tomorrow. And uh, unfortunately, we will not be able to use the labs for office hours. So if there's too many people, we're just going to have to squeeze into 2084. There don't, don't, there don't seem to be any other rooms available in that area. So sorry about that. We never plan for so many people to come to office hours, I guess. I've put up the first announcement about the midterm. Uh, it's coming. <laughs> so I want to give you some warning about that. You'll be hearing more about it as it, as it approaches. Uh, I will only remind you at this stage of the game that it's Wednesday, September 29th from 8 to 9 a.m. And, and different sections will be in different rooms. So not everybody will come to Pimentel. And there will be a handout that describes where you go. And it's very important you go to the room that your lecture discussion is assigned to, not your lab, okay? your lecture discussion. Because if you're in the wrong room, then basically your exam has the possibility or your exam uh, scantron of, of getting lost. Okay. You don't want that to happen. Uh, there will be at least one review by me on Saturday the 25th from 11 to 1. And, and we'll tell you more about that, where it is. But I'm telling you nice and early, so if you were planning on going away that weekend, you can go away, but you're going to miss the review. The re review is not webcast. And uh, there will be more uh, details on that later, okay? so. It's two weeks from Wednesday. That's the bottom line. Okay, today I'm going to talk uh, some more about enzymes, enzyme structure and function, and probably get a bit in, into the regulation of enzyme activity. And it's very convenient in terms of the lab this week because you're doing the enzymes lab, which involves uh, the use of an enzyme salivary amylase, an enzyme isolated from saliva which is involved in the breakdown of starch, uh, amylose and amylopectin, to maltose. And you will be studying various properties of the, that enzyme, uh, some of which may be discussed today, but certainly some of which will be discussed on Wednesday. So I introduced the subject at the end of the hour. And you can see they cleaned the bench off. They always, they're so efficient here. They cleaned the bench off every time. And I gave you that. Uh, very dramatic demonstration of what happens to glucose plus oxygen, uh, which has a negative free energy change. Uh, and if you put the glucose in the presence of oxygen on a bench, nothing happens. That's because the thermodynamic parameters that govern the reaction, that is delta G, delta H, delta S, those things, uh, do not deal with the rates of the reactions. There's no kinetic component in that analysis. There are thermodynamicists who deal with sort of free energy, and there are the thermodynamicists who deal with kinetics. But the two have to meet at some point. And the way cells overcome this thermodynamic uh, barrier, I guess I should call it, is by using catalysts. Catalysts are compounds that are um, make reactions go faster, although they are not consumed during the course of the reaction. And, and, and I discussed at some length what uh, biological catalysts are. They are either proteins or RNA molecules, ribosomes, which have been discovered more, much more recently than enzymes. And uh, they function by lowering the activation energy for a reaction. So now what we have to try to understand is, um, how do enzymes, we're talking about enzymes. We're not talking about ribozymes here. That's part of the second portion of the class. So how do proteins do this? And what are some of the properties of these enzymes that make them so special? So I put up here a very simple reaction, which is the way most people look at enzymes. Uh, an enzyme will react with a compound known as the substrate to form an enzyme substrate complex. And then the substrate is converted into the product. And 
it's released from the enzyme. You don't want the product hanging around for long periods of time because then another substrate mo molecule cannot bind to the enzyme. The substrates bind transiently to what is called the active site of an enzyme. If you look at figure 78 and uh, 79 in your handout, you can see the first one, 78, simply shows what I've said here. It shows a molecule binding to an enzyme, the, enzyme, the, product, the substrate being converted into product. But what's more important about figure 79 is it shows that there are many different amino acid side chains that are usually involved in the binding of the substrate. And they come about when a protein folds into its native conformation, be it a tertiary structure or a quaternary structure. What it's possible to achieve through this folding is bringing lots of amino acid side chains that may not be close in the linear sequence of amino acids, but they become close due to the folding of the protein. And the folded protein has a region in which substrates can bind. And you can see there are a number of interactions between the substrate and the protein uh, in figure 79. And there it also says that weak bonds are involved in this binding, hydrogen bonds, ionic bonds, because the substrate has to bind and then leave quickly. Covalent bonding is not what you would expect to see in the binding of a substrate to an enzyme. Um, I want you to jump ahead and look at figure 81, which I kind of like, because figure 81 to the right shows the actual binding of a substrate, which is this molecule cyclic AMP, which I briefly talked about uh, when I talked about nucleotides. It's not important what it is. But you can see that there are a number of amino acids involved. Uh, they come from different portions of the chain. And there are hydrogen bonds. There are, um, I, I'm looking to see if there are any charged bonding. Yes, there is. If you look closely at that, you can see there are charged amino acid side chains which are interacting with this molecule. There are hydrogen, there's hydrogen bonding. So you get some picture, I hope, of how the nature of the binding of a substrate at the active site of an enzyme. Now, a couple of features of this interaction. Enzymes have high specificity. By that, I mean because there is a specific interaction of the substrate with various amino acid side chains, you might expect that certain compounds are going to bind very well and certain compounds are going to bind less well. I didn't say there is perfect specificity. That is, an enzyme may, to some degree, slight degree, react with compounds that are related to its main substrate. And uh, uh, you'll hear later on when we talk about photosynthesis about an interesting problem that arises because of substrate specificity with a very key enzyme in photosynthesis. So be aware. There's high specificity. Um, I actually did give you the, all the names of these enzymes in table 46 that I mentioned, or not 46, 86. And, and what you see, for example, in molecules, enzymes that are phosphatases, that take off phosphates um, from various molecules, they may react with a large number of different phosphated, phosphorylated compounds. but they're only dealing with phosphate removal. So again, there is specificity. Um, the efficiency of enzymes, as I said, they're catalysts. They work over and over and over again. The efficiency of, of their operation is, in some cases, remarkable. There's a table, which is figure 82, that gives something known as the turnover number. The turnover number represents the number of molecules of product formed or substrate uh, altered, degraded um, per protein molecule per second. And at the top of that list is an enzyme, which we'll talk about later, carbonic anhydrase. Does a very interesting reaction. 
It takes, it's present in red blood cells. It is involved in uh, maintaining the pH of the red blood cell because oxygen binding to hemoglobin is pH dependent. And what it does is it takes carbon dioxide plus water, and it is a reversible reaction, and it forms carbonic acid. It's a relatively simple reaction. 60,000 molecules of carbonic, acid, of carbonic acid are formed per second per enzyme molecule. Uh, I think, I'm not sure if that's the fastest enzyme. The, one of the enzymes I talked about during the cell structure, the enzyme catalase, which breaks down hydrogen peroxide in peroxisomes, is also at, at or near the top of that list. But different enzymes have different turnover numbers. Uh, some of them don't work very well, but they still work better than the uncatalyzed rate, such as the enzyme lysozyme, which is down at the bottom. But you can see numbers in the hundreds of thousands of, of molecules being, say, produced, product produced per second. So they are little wonders, I would say. Um, There have been various models proposed to, to describe how enzymes actually work. Uh, the first one, the sort of classic model in this field, is shown at the top of figure 80. This is called a lock and key mechanism. And basically, the lock and key mechanism visualized that you have a, a, a static, stable structure in the enzyme. The substrate comes in and fits into that structure. There's no change in shape of the substrate. There's no change in shape of the enzyme. And then something through that interaction, the bonds of the substrate are altered. Maybe it's something is being slid off the substrate. There's a weakening of the bonds through that interaction. And then the product is released. So the enzyme in this model was rigid and it's like putting your key into the door, the, 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 the lock of the door. The lock of the door is not changing shape. The key is not changing shape. They just fit together in the right way. Um, in the 1960s or so, as it became known that enzymes can undergo conformational changes, that is, proteins in general and enzymes in particular can undergo changes in shape. Some of them are small, some of them are larger. Uh, what this led to was a model which is known as the induced fit model for enzyme mechanism proposed by uh, Daniel Koshland, who was a very prominent protein biochemist in his earlier days, uh, worked in, New, in the, on the East Coast but came out to Berkeley in uh, about 1968 or so, 65 maybe, and was in the biochemistry department. That was the department I was in, so I knew Daniel Koshland. Dan Koshland was a very distinguished, um, as I said, protein chemist, and he, pro he proposed this idea that there is, there are changes in shape in particularly the protein as the substrate binds to the protein. The protein is shown again in figure 80, the middle. You can see the active site there. But as the substrate starts to bind to the active site, the protein is changing shape. And that's inducing changes in the substrate molecule, allowing products to be formed. Um, I think the, most people would accept the evidence that it was provided through the 60s and 70s for this idea of how enzymes function. So this idea that the, that the molecule is rigid, inflexible, it has been pretty much abandoned. It seems now to be widely accepted that um, the molecule, it's more like the molecule starts like this, and as the substrate approaches, it becomes more available to that substrate molecule, allowing binding. When the products for, leave, the molecule relaxes again back to its native conformation. These are not big structural changes. They're small structural changes because they have to happen quickly. Uh, so induced fit model is generally accepted, I would say. And uh, 
right, this was a sort of a major advance, this idea of the flexibility of proteins and enzymes in their catalytic activity. I'd also mention that uh, Dan Koshland and his wife, who was in the immunology department, were um, good friends of this campus. By that I mean they donated a lot of money to this campus. The building that I am presently located in, where my office is, is called Koshland Hall, named after Professor Koshland. The bioscience library down in LSB, how many, how many people have been to the bioscience library? That's named after Miriam Koshland. So they uh, consistently were uh, major donors to, to the activities of the campus. Okay. Okay, now we're going to come back to something that I talked about way back when, in the first or second lecture, and that is prosthetic groups. And I said I would talk about prosthetic groups again, and now's the time. What many enzymes contain are prosthetic groups, low molecular weight groups that are bound at the active site of an enzyme. By that, immediately you should recognize that these prosthetic groups are required for the activity. And I'll give you an example or two of systems showing how a prosthetic group is actually involved in the activity of a particular enzyme. Now, you're going to find different terms to describe prosthetic groups in the textbook and in biochemistry books. You're going to find words like cofactors and coenzymes. And I find these terms to be very fuzzy. I don't know what a cofactor is. I don't know what a coenzyme is. I do know that a prosthetic group, that name gives me some information about what this thing is doing in assisting m reactions to occur. So I prefer to call these types of things that are bound to proteins, bound to enzymes, and function in their catalytic activity, prosthetic groups. They can be, they come in two varieties. Variety one is organic compounds. Variety two, inorganic compounds. The organic compounds are related to vitamins. How many people here take a vitamin pill in the morning? A fair number. Now, I thought there'd be more. When you take a vitamin pill and you look, if you look at the label, what you see, part of the example of what you see, is you see vitamin B1, B2, B3, B6, and B12. And these are what this, these are. Vitamin B2, it says riboflavin. Vitamin B1, it says thiamine. Vitamin B3, it says niacin. Vitamin B6, it says pyridoxal. Vitamin B12, it says cobalt. The organic molecules that are prosthetic groups in proteins are derivatives of these vitamins. For example, thiamine is, is modified to a compound known as I don't know why I want to write this out. It's a good example. Thiamine pyrophosphate. It's a phosphorylated derivative of thiamine, and that is then inserted into various enzymes and functions in the catalytic activity of the enzyme. So what is shown in table 83 is the, quote, vitamin, such as thiamine, and then the derivative that is the prosthetic group, thiamine pyrophosphate. Niacin is converted into not nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. Pyridoxal phosphate comes from vitamin B6, etc. So the organic prosthetic groups are related to vitamins. This is why you need to take a vitamin. You know, maybe you never understood this. I mean, everybody says vitamins are good. You don't get them in your food. Well, these vitamins become part of the active component of an various enzymes in the cell, and that's why they are required. If we look at figure 84, I'll try to draw this because this is an example of a prosthetic group and how it functions in the activity of an enzyme. So we've got this compound, again, I do not expect you to remember these structures. I certainly can't remember the st these structures. 
this is biotin. You have this in your handout. What happens to biotin is it is attached to an enzyme through this carboxyl group. So what happens is you form a, a bond here, like this, to a protein. So clearly, uh, this is not going to come off the protein. It's going to stay on the protein. What is important for you to know is the kind of enzymes that use biotin are known as carboxylases. And in this case, these are enzymes that are taking CO2 and adding it to another molecule. When they do this, the CO2 actually binds to biotin like this and then reacts with a different substrate. This is a, th these are enzymes that take a substrate plus CO2 to form a product. And the function of biotin in this enzyme is to actually bind the CO2, one of the two substrates. Almost all enzymes known as carboxylases contain biotin in them. So I think this is just a, a good example of how uh, a molecule functions at the active site of an enzyme. Obviously, this is the active site of the enzyme because this is the substrate, one of the substrates of the molecule. Okay, so this thing has to be sitting at the active site of this particular enzyme. Um, you can find similar mechanisms involving thiamine pyrophosphate in enzymes. That's another very good example if you're interested in looking at this in detail. Okay, so these are the organic prosthetic groups. The inorganic prosthetic groups, what are they? Well, you, oh, incidentally, you are probably aware of the kind of deficiencies that you can have if you don't have sufficient vitamins. Uh, berry, berry, thiamine deficiency. Um, scurvy, I didn't mention ascorbic acid, but ascorbic acid is not exactly uh, what we want to talk about here, but things like that. So if you have a vitamin deficiency, you generally will end up with a fairly serious uh, illness. Okay, the inorganic prosthetic groups are metal ions. For example, iron, copper, zinc, magnesium, manganese, all of these metal ions are functioning as prosthetic groups. Already, I've given you the example of heme. Heme is an iron-containing compound which is put into proteins like hemoglobin and a whole nother range of proteins we'll talk about um, next week. And uh, they, some of these function as components that transfer electrons. Fe3 plus plus an electron to Fe2 plus. That's an oxidation reduction reaction. This um, what did I say? Okay. The other example is copper, 2 plus, plus an electron to cuprin, cuprous ion. So there are a bunch of proteins, a bunch of enzymes, where the transition metal ion is actually undergoing oxidation reduction. There are additionally transition metal ions which are not undergoing oxidation reduction but are still directly involved in the catalytic reaction. Let's see if I can put this. Okay, you can look at figure 85, but I'll also put this on the board, on the overhead, if I can. Blow it up. It's a little hard to see. It's getting better. Too much. Okay, I'll have to stop there. This is carbonic anhydrase, the enzyme I was just talking about. In this enzyme, that is a zinc ion. This is also shown in figure 85. The zinc ion sits there. It's surrounded by histidines, three histidine residues. Figure 
The figure to the right shows the actual three-dimensional structure, the X-ray structure of carbonic anhydrase. Carbonic anhydrase is a rather small protein. I think it's about 30,000 molecular weight. And this is all protein. You can see there's not a lot of alpha helix in this protein. There's some beta sheet. But a lot of it is just sort of random uh, structure. But in the middle of it is this zinc bound to three um, histidine. And when you look at the right-hand part of figure 85, that shows you the mechanism of this very simple reaction that I had on the board and I erased. That is, it shows the histidine actually binds water, and the water then reacts with carbon dioxide to form carbonic acid. So the histidine is in carbonic, carbonic anhydrase is finding one of the substrates of the reaction. Again, it's a very simple uh, reaction. But um, the prosthetic group is carrying out, participating directly in the catalytic activity. Uh, OK, so that is sort of the structural aspect of enzymes. Does, does anybody have any questions? Because we're going to sort of change direction a little, not that much. OK, you had your chance. OK, the next thing I want to talk about, which is certainly relevant to, to the lab this week, uh, are factors that regulate activity of enzymes. The important point here, there's an important point that I have to make at the outset of this. And that point is that not all enzymes in a cell are active all the time. One of the sort of big take-home lessons of, I think, the first two parts of this course is why are, why, what differentiates the different types of cells we have, say, in various organisms, in multicellular organisms? We have blood cells, muscle cells, liver cells, skin cells, on and on and on and on. All of those cells have the same DNA in them, right? You don't have different kinds of DNA in your blood cell from your liver cell. Yet those cells are different. And there are, I think, two reasons why for these differences. One of them, relates to the molecular biology of the system. That is, you've got genes in DNA, and not all the genes in DNA are expressed at the same time in every cell. So some proteins are they're never synthesized. They're shut off. But you also have the possibility of when you make proteins, in particular enzymes that we're talking about now, not all of these enzymes are active in every cell at the same time. And this allows for this differentiation of cells, for specialization of cells. Certain cells have certain activities and functions. They will use a subset of the proteins that are synthesized. So regulation of enzyme activity is very important. And again, once sort of our understanding of protein structure came about in the, the detailed understanding we have today, uh, I think the area of Regulation of activity jumped up in terms of becoming more important because of the structural information that we had. The first thing you can do or see to regulate the activity of an enzyme is you can vary the substrate concentration. So this is substrate, and this is activity. And this is an experiment you'll do in lab this week. And one sees a curve that looks like that. The Activity increases with substrate, and then the activity levels off at some optimal rate. Remember, this is just this region up here. The activity, the enzyme is still working, working very well, but it, its activity is not increasing as I increase the substrate concentration. You saw this kind of figure when I talked about active transport or transport facilitated or active, these systems show saturation behavior. That is, the activity will not increase when you increase the substrate concentration. The explanation for this is that um, you've got a limited amount of enzymes. 
you've got a fair amount of substrate around, eventually you reach a point where every enzyme molecule in the cell is, is working as little heart out as fast as it can, okay? So increasing substrate is not going to increase the rate of the reaction. When one sees this type of behavior, this is known as Michaelis Menten kinetics, because we'll distinguish it from a different kind of kinetic later. And it is the kind of enzymatic behavior that one sees for I wouldn't say all enzymes, it's certainly not all enzymes, many enzymes, okay? Uh, you will, you will, some of you will make this kind of measurement in lab. There are two parameters that are associated with the michaelis menten kinetics. One is the maximum rate, which is known as V max. And the other is uh, uh, a factor where you go down so this is 100%. You go down 50% in rate, and you determine the substrate concentration that gives 50% of the maximum rate, okay, which would be this. And that is known as the Km for the reaction. So the Km is a concentration. The Vmax is a rate. Now, the Km is related in some way loose way to how tightly a substrate binds to the enzyme. But it's very loose. It is a number that is distinctive for every particular enzyme. So if you go into the lab and you're measuring, um, you're measure, doing some measurements on, on glycolysis and you measure, you're studying hexokinase, the first reaction in gly glycolysis, glucose plus ATP converted into glucose 6-phosphate, Probably the first measurement you would make in the characterization of that enzyme is the determination of the Km and the Vmax. Because those two numbers do give you some useful information. If you determine, if you determine, actually this is supposed to be little m, but it doesn't matter. If you determine the michaelis menten constant, the Km for an enzyme, and it turns out to be very high, that is, the concentration is like 100 millimolar some very high concentration, and you know that the cell doesn't have anything like that concentration of substrate, you, there's a problem. Very high, you know, if, the, if you know the cell only has one millimolar of the substrate, then it becomes a problem as to how that enzyme could function at any significant rate in the process. Similarly, if the maximum rate of a reaction is very slow, then again, that presents a, a mechanistic problem. Uh, and there are ways around this because these numbers can be changed depending on whether an enzyme can be activated or something like that. But there, there, are, there are some reasons for determining the Km and Vmax for an enzyme that's under investigation. Uh, all enzymes have different Kms and Vmaxes, so you might have one that has a Km of one millimolar, and the next enzyme you look at it may be a tenth that, maybe you know less than one millimolar. So there's no fixed Km. The Km is determined by the nature of the active site of the enzyme and the nature of the substrate and how well it binds to that enzyme. The second way you can affect the activity of an enzyme is by changing the temperature. So most enzymes will have temperature profiles that look like this. So this is temperature. That's wrong. Erase that. This is activity as a function of temperature. This is something you will certainly do in the lab. And you generally see bell-shaped curves like this. Uh, you might expect that for an enzyme like amylase, which functions in our saliva, that this temperature would be somewhere around 38.6 degrees. Uh, and you'll see what it is, OK? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. 
Um, the, these kind of bell-shaped curves show that the activity of the enzyme increases, goes to a certain temperature, and then that activity starts to decrease. What, what, what's going on? Suggestions? Why does the temperature, why does the enzyme lose activity as the temperature increases? It's denaturing, right. So, I mean, you know if you heat proteins, they denature. So the enzyme starts to lose activity as it is becoming unfolded. Presumably, you're increasing the number of collisions that are occurring when you are below that temperature and you come to an optimum where you've optimized the possibility of the enzyme and substrate colliding with each other. Interestingly, you can take enzymes uh, say that are in liver cells that have optima at 38.6 degrees, and you can look at the same enzyme in a bacterium that grows in a rather harsh environment. I may have mentioned that I was up in uh, Yellowstone a few months ago, early June, and uh, they have all these, you know, gurgling ponds and smoky, smelly things. It's a great place to go. But uh, these, these ponds are generally almost boiling or near boiling or slightly below boiling in temperature, and there are organisms that are growing in these ponds. And um, obviously, they have temperature optima that have been adapted. They have, so you can look at the same enzyme that we have, which has an optimum at 38.6, and you look at it in some bacterium, and it has an optimum of 95 degrees centigrade, which is, you know, unreal, but it is real. And it's a very interesting question as to what changes in this enzyme are allowing it to function basically in a boiling water bath. So I think that's a real interesting problem. The next thing I want to mention, and this will lead you to a little thought project, is what is the effect of pH on enzymes? Well, you might expect that for enzymes that are functioning in a nice, normal, happy, healthy environment, uh, like our cells, this would be pH 2, 4, 6, 8. You know, somewhere around pH 8 would be the optimum for these, temp for, for these enzymes. Although, obviously, enzymes that, form, that function in unusual environments, like in our stomach, I think the pH of our stomach is 1, okay? There are proteolytic enzymes, and the enzymes that digest proteins that can function basically down here at pH 1 or 2. Uh, so this would be a stomach enzyme. Now. I'm not going to tell you what happens during this bell-shaped curve in relation to pH. By that I mean, uh, I want you to think about it. Why does activity increase up to an optimum and then decrease beyond that optimum? It has to do with, again, the structure of the protein, the structure of the active site. And if you, uh, if you can think about this and come up with a reasonable idea about it, it will reflect your understanding of uh, side chains in proteins and, and uh, things that can happen to those side chains when you change the pH. So it's got a lot to do with protein structure. So those are, those are three things, very substrate, very temperature, very pH, that uh, are, are generally done when one is characterizing an enzyme. And as I said, you will, you will do some of these things uh, this week in lab. Okay. Another factor that comes in, in sort of the regulation of the, the activity of an enzyme, relates to compounds that can inhibit enzymes. Again, as I've said, enzymes aren't perfect. So there are compounds in cells which are known as inhibitors. And if you look at 
figure 88, it shows two kinds of inhibition that can occur in, with enzymes. One is competitive, competitive inhibition. And the second is non-competitive inhibition. And, and that figure shows pretty well the difference between these two. Uh, to the left, you have competitive inhibition, which shows you have an active site of an enzyme and you have an inhibitor. That inhibitor competes with the substrate. It binds to the active site of the enzyme. So as I said, way back here, enzymes are, have high, spi high specificity, but they're not perfect. So there are R compounds that can, to some degree, look like the substrate. They'll bind to the active site of that enzyme, and then the substrate can't bind. So you will get no activity. So they compete with the substrate. Now, it's generally found that um, competitive inhibition can be overcome by adding more substrate. In other words, you can. It's, it, if you've got two molecules and they're sort of similar in their interaction with the protein, if you increase this one, it's going to work better. The classic example of a competitive inhibitor is the molecule carbon monoxide or hydrogen cyanide, carbon monoxide, or HCN. Both of these as you probably realize, are highly toxic. You know, if you uh, go into the garage and turn the car on and close the, the door of the garage, you produce a lot of carbon monoxide and you kill yourself. It's a very common way of doing it, I guess. Uh, cyanide is uh, used in things like gas chambers if they're still used. You know, these are bad compounds. Why do these compounds kill you? Because they compete with oxygen for binding on a heme in an enzyme which is known as cytochrome oxidase, which we'll talk, of, talk about much more in more detail later. But it's the major enzyme in mitochondria that uses oxygen, uses oxygen in the oxidative phosphorylation pathway. You make ATP. If you don't have this enzyme functioning, then you stop ATP formation, and of course, you're going to die very quickly. So carbon monoxide, or HCN, can be um, competitive inhibitor inhibitors with molecular oxygen, and uh, they are lethal, OK? Put this bag up. Non-competitive inhibition. Okay, non-competitive inhibition is shown to the right of the figure, and what is shown there is you have the active site on the enzyme, but you have some other site on the enzyme, not the active site, an inhibitor binding site. The inhibitor binds that site, and it changes the structure of the active site indirectly through some type of conformational change in the protein, and that does not allow the substrate to bind. Adding more substrate in a situation where you have a non-competitive inhibitor has no effect on the inhibition. Now, so the, these two, you have to keep them straight. Competitive inhibi inhibition, non-competitive -inhibi non inhibition. And, and, you know, I make sort of a big deal out of inhibitors because, unfortunately, in our environment, we are exposed to lots of different kinds of compounds. Some of them are nebulous, they're negative, I mean, there's no effect. But some of them can inhibit one of the many, many kinds of reactions that are occurring in cells, in which case you are going to have some metabolic problem. So again, this is a way you will alter the activity of particular enzymes. You can inhibit them or you can not inhibit them. Um, okay, I, it's, 
five minutes early, but I'm going to stop because the next subject is more complicated and, and it will just confuse you if I go into it now. So if you have any questions, you can come up and ask me. Otherwise, we'll continue with regulation on Wednesday.